Well, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Okay, great, thanks. Um, first of all, uh, I'd like to, to thank the, uh, the committee here uh, for uh, inviting us to, to come and, and present. Um, everybody worked very hard, and uh, so far it's going very well. So thank you, committee, for having us here. And I want to thank all of you attendees as well for being here and, uh, and learning with, with all of us together. Um, on the first slide here, I also want to make a, a couple other thank yous. Uh, Bradley Piper, who is a, our senior project manager, was going to be my co-presenter, unfortunately, due to some issues at work that he had to handle. He couldn't be here. So uh, thanks to Brad. He uh, played an integral part in building this presentation. And a special thanks to Nat Phillips, uh, who is our uh, LIDAR technical advisor at work and extremely brilliant and very nice man who also provided a lot of, uh, a lot of data for this particular presentation. So just a brief overview of uh, Kachera for those of you who don't know who we are. We've been in business for over 70 years. Uh, we are a small business entity under the $15 million federal uh, regulations uh, per year in, um, in revenues. Um, we have uh, hundreds, we've done hundreds of, uh, of aerial collection and, and data generation projects uh, throughout the, uh, the US and, and worldwide. I'll talk about that in a few, few minutes. We have basically um, five twin engine, seven aircraft total. Uh, we have large format four band uh, sensors, um, cameras. Uh, we do have uh, we do have a lidar, two lidars, um, and uh, we have um, aircraft with twin belly ports, which is somewhat unusual in our industry. So uh, we capture aerial imagery and lidar at the same time. Um, we've got about fifty folks working uh, in uh, in our mapping and geospatial group. Um, we have branch offices in Columbus, Pittsburgh, Tampa, and uh, Charleston. And uh, the experience outside the U.S., if you all recall, around 2011, there was some massive flooding in Central Europe. Uh, we were called in and we mapped a good portion of Poland between uh, late 2011 and early 2013, delivered the data up there. Uh, we also did a lot of work in the Caribbean. Uh, it seems like a disaster to bring us around. Uh, we did, uh, did Haiti after uh, after the um, Haitian earthquake in 2010, and we fly periodically in the Caribbean. Of course, we've done some work in Canada as well. So just a brief overview. I'm not going to go through and read all this stuff to you. Um, you guys can, can read that perfectly well. But I think uh, one of the, the main areas that, that you all may find of interest, and we'll talk later in the presentation, are the impacts of vegetation on uh, LIDAR data collection. So I'm going to be, begin by talking about um, ground control for a typical leaf off project. Um, so let's talk about a potential solar farm site. And, and I will tell you that over the past several years, uh, that particular market space has been growing almost exponentially. Uh, we continue to receive a ton of requests for, uh, for flying um, areas that are, are potentially going to be uh, built out into uh, solar collecting farms. Um, some of the project areas are as small as 100 acres. We can fly that small. And then some are thousands of acres and, and tens and dozens and sometimes even hundreds of square miles. Um, those sizes are basically uh, geographic uh, dependent. So the smaller sizes tend to be out east here. The larger sizes tend to be in the west where there's simply more land. When you're doing control, usually about six to eight points for the smaller projects, 12 to 20 for the larger projects. They're just, it's distributed around and through the AOI. Generally, it's done with uh, RTK and, and, and core GPS observations. A lot of times people are looking for five centimeter vertical in, uh, in open areas. These are your typical datums and units, pretty standard throughout the uh, continental US. So let's talk a little further about this hypothetical solar site. So um, generally, when we're developing a, a project for folks, um, they'll give us a, a KML or a KMZ. By the way, I have to say thank you, Google Earth, because I'm old enough, and some of you may be old enough to remember the days when we had to get, oh, really badly faxed pieces of USGS quad maps, and they had a little circle around them, and folks were like, we'd like you to map this thing. Oh, that was painful. Nowadays, people just send us KMLs or KMZs, and uh, and and we can uh, we can ingest them directly, and we can do our uh, internal flight planning. Um, 
We can also do control planning using Google Earth. We'll discuss that a little bit further. The, the two softwares uh, that we generally use are Lead Air, which is a track air software. We use that when we're doing our imagery planning. And for, uh, for our Optech sensors, we use their Airborne mis Mission Manager for LiDAR. So um, I'm going to show you actually, I'm going to talk about this first, and I'm going to actually show you some imagery of, of this hypothetical project. Uh, it was, so we have eight flight lines plus one cross tie for nine total flight lines. When we're flying for uh, highly accurate, any type of, of data sets, we generally throw a cross tie line in. And do, do you, you understand what I'm saying by a cross tie line? Is it, do you get, am I speaking in, in language that most folks get? Okay, I'll show you the, the imagery. It'll, it'll help a little bit if you don't quite understand that. But the cross tie line actually helps ensure that, uh, that the data set uh, meets um, uh, meets uh, the specifications required by the uh, the customer and helps us get to that five centimeter vertical, for instance, with our, our LIDAR data. Um, so we, we fly the complete uh, area of interest coverage. Usually we have a slight uh, additional area outside of the AOI. Um, for this particular hypothetical flight, we're at 5,225 feet above mean sea level. That means if you're up here in uh, western Pennsylvania, um, you you will have to have uh, th you have to minus out for where your ground actually is. So uh, this would be in maybe around in this area. This might be around uh, 40, 45, 4,600 feet. So um, we have fifteen survey control points here. The lidar was requested at twenty points per square meter with that five centimeter vertical accuracy and a three inch three band RGB imagery uh, data set to be collected and turned into orthos. So we have 140 is the number of images. I'm going to show you some photos here. So this is our potential solar farm site. You can see our flight lines. The yellow area is the area of interest. It's going to be mapped out. You can see these are our control points. And if you look carefully, thank you, Google Earth, again, you'll see that these control points are generally located in areas where they're open areas. Uh, partic uh, it's particularly important that they be flat uh, paved areas, if possible. Um, some of them might actually be uh, painted control um, of, a, of a size if we're going to use some supplemental aerial imagery. But in this case, most of these are just GPS points. And again, you can see that we tried to cover the entire area here, have some outside. And if possible, they're in paved areas, parking lots, uh, sides of roads, things like that, and as flat as possible. And in the open area. So this is kind of a typical um, LiDAR flight plan. And this is a little animation here. That's adding in the imagery. So you have your 140 images on here. See it covers the whole area. And um, those, those images are again collected free band. So red, green, and blue. And they will be turned into to orthos uh, at, at the uh, at the end of the project. And as I noticed, uh, I know it's either your 20 points per square meter LIDAR and three inch ground sample distance for the imagery. Okay, so here's some products for your typical leaf off project. Contours, generally they're asking around here for about one foot contour intervals. Planimetric features, planimetric features can be roads, bridges, houses, pretty much anything man-made that can, that can show up that they, they may want to add to the mapping data set. And they'll ask for digital elevation models. A lot of times they want them in geotiff images. So this is typical mapping products. For the LiDAR data products, we deliver LAS or LAZ point clouds, and that's generally classified to the ground. As I said, 20 points per square meter, five centimeter accuracy, um, digital ortho photos, and, and three inch, three band imagery. Now, if you look up here, this is just your typical orthophotos, right? This is a little bit difficult to see, I realize. That's kind of an eye chart. Sorry about that. These are actually your one foot contours of the project area. Down here is, is a digital elevation model at three foot and your ground classified LIDAR. So this is a typical leaf off project that we get all the time, particularly at that size in the eastern part of the country uh, for, uh, for folks that are, are going to be planning solar. And by the way, um, Generally, the folks that come to us are, are engineering companies and others, and this will be, eventually become part of an ALTA survey. 
uh, which is uh, which is required for uh, for generating um, um, plant site plans for uh, for solar. Now we just fell into a black hole. So uh, back to your uh, back, John, or back to your um, your your folks who are uh, uh, astrophysicists. Um, what is a typical uh, topographic light or leaf off project? Well, so far we haven't found one. Um, they don't exist. They're, the way that we look at them is they're, they're very much singular in nature, and I'll explain why as we go through, but there's no such thing as a typical topographic layer leaf on project. Now, that being said, there are some folks in this room who we work with who have some standards. For instance, they, they simply require that, that everything be captured at, say, 40 points per square meter because that's how they have their systems working, but in general, Every one of these has to be developed as a singular project. So here are some questions that you have to ask about leaf on projects because they are different from your typical leaf off projects. So can you capture the leaf on LIDAR and generate an acceptable ground model? Is it possible? Uh, what accuracy and products can be achieved? Can you get that five centimeter? Can you get the one foot? What are some keys to accuracy? The rest of the presentation is going to focus on this stuff. What technological factors impact your LIDAR data collection? And most importantly, in many cases, what about the vegetation? So for those of you that aren't familiar with LIDAR, this nice, wonderful picture here is a, is a rather dumbed down depiction of what LIDAR is. So the sun is coming through this heavily vegetated area. And you can see some areas are very bright, lots of sun coming through. Some are very dark and, and shadowed areas. You really can't see too much over there. But that there's still data everywhere. Just because it's shadow doesn't mean that it's a black hole and there's nothing there. What it simply means is it's more difficult or maybe not possible for your LiDAR data, your LiDAR sensor to come through and reach that spot. It might reach other spots all around it, but it might not reach that spot. So that's just kind of a quick depiction. So if, if you imagine, you know, standing under your tree canopy and looking up, seeing something like that, this would be your, this would be your LIDAR. So let's talk about some answers to those questions. What about accuracy? Well, generally when you're mapping, you think that more control will make everything better, that you'll have better data set. Um, that's not always the case. So you can put a ton of additional checkpoints all around your area but they may not really help you. And well, why, Ed, why, why wouldn't these guys help us? I mean, the more the better, right? More checkpoints has to be better. Well, it all depends. And um, why? Well, sky view issues are important, especially with older equipment. If you have a very heavy vegetation canopy and you're under there with your GPS unit, you may not be able to get a lock on your three or more satellites that are required. And if you can't get a satellite lock, then you're not going to get a very good horizontal and vertical solution under there. So you, if in very heavy vegetated areas, you have to take that into account. You may not get what you need. The other thing is uh, forest ground litter and understory, like fallen trees, leaves, ferns, and brush. That's a good depiction of it right over there. Um, you can't set up a GPS unit here uh, for a number of reasons. Number one, it might tilt over right off the tripod. Number two, um, you're not on a flat surface and you're going to get whatever heights in here uh, above the actual ground and that's going to mess you up, especially if you're looking for five centimeter. So that could be, uh, that could definitely be an, an issue. Um, I, you know, if you have a lot of understory, uh, it's just, it's, it's going to mess up your models. So um, other things that come into play are, are existing LIDAR data. So there's a lot of LIDAR data out there, folks. I mean, there's tons. Uh, USGS has been collecting it. Uh, local government entities have been collecting it. So it exists. It's all over the place. Uh, one of the speakers talked about the free LIDAR data that's available. And it's great to have free LIDAR data. And, and you might even be able to use it, but you have to ask yourself some questions. And they don't just involve data accuracy. There's other things that you have to take into account. And this is also true in many ways with imagery. It's sort of the same equation. So when, when was that collected? How old is the data? 
that can make a big difference because the, the older the data, if you're in an area that has been highly developed or lots of changes have happened, uh, you may be in for some, some, some issues here and it may not be as valuable as you would like, like it to be. So when was it collected? Was it collected leaf on or leaf off? Um, almost all the old stuff was collected leaf on, but some may, uh, leaf off, sorry, but some may be collected leaf on and you'll, you'll want to know that. So what, what's the accuracy of, of, the, of the data source? Uh, do you have, um, do you have um, GPS control and other things that you can look at in the, in the uh, metadata of the data set so you know how accurate it is? You're going to want to know about the points per square meter is it collected at and the sensor type. And you have to factor in what's the time and cost to obtain this and what's its ultimate, ultimate usefulness. So this is, this is something you have to take into account when you're, when you're going through uh, thinking about using existing data. It may be better just to not even bother trying to use the existing data and collect from scratch. So um, another question that we had is uh, what are some technological factors? Um, Multi-pulse systems are something that, that is, have come out more recently in, the, uh, in, in, in today's world. So the more pulses that can be detected, uh, the better the data, perhaps, um, because multi-pulse is a better vegetation penetrator. Now, what that means is that um, if, you're, if your system is sending out a single pulse, it's going to go down and it's going to hit one thing and it's going to come back to you. And that's the only thing you're going to see. If you have a multi-pulse system, picture a tree. You might hit the top of the tree. You might hit a branch in the middle of the tree. You might hit right near the stump of the tree and you'll probably get to the ground. And those will all come back up to the light area. So with, with multi-pulse systems, um, four or more pulses are the normal today. Our T2000 system uh, is, is able to bring in eight. Uh, so so that, that becomes very important for things like vegetation uh, penetration. And as, as I described, you had more and varied point, point heights out of that. Uh, the strength of the laser is important. The more energy that the laser puts out, uh, the better your chance of reaching the ground in a uh, vegetated region. Now there are eye, eye issues there and, and lasers are only allowed to go up to a certain, uh, a certain amount of, of, of power and um, you can only fly at a certain height with certain powerful lasers. So you have to factor that into account, but, um, but the strength is also important. If you have a weak laser, you're probably gonna have weak returns. Uh, the sensitivity of the laser is also in, in important. So if, if, the, if you're able to capture weak signals, you have more chance for, for ground returns. Again, you know, picture that tree in your mind. Um, higher point density, 20, 40, 60, 80 points per square meter. It may positively impact. Uh, you can get to potentially have more chance of ground capture, not always. And the other thing is the angle of incidence. And that, that equates to fear, field of view. So if you see these two graphics over here, and I've seen some, some similar graphics to this previously. This graphic up here is somebody doing your typical topographic LIDAR collect, and maybe that might be at eight or 10 points per square meter or, or less than that. Down here, this might be 20 points per square meter. Notice the field of view is much narrower and they're flying over a vegeta vegetated area. So, so potentially a narrower field of view, higher points per square meter, better penetration, better data set. However, I have a little equation here that is out of the head of Ed here, so uh, it's, it's made up. But the greater your field of density and the less the field of view equals a greater poten potential point density plus greater dollars to collect the data. More flight lines. I'll tell you, more flight lines with a, with a, a field of view that is, is less than greater. So um, now to the most important part. What about the vegetation? Well, it's a little difficult to see on, on the graph here, but um, in the green here, you can see it's quite obvious that this is a, a tree, a veg some vegetation above ground, pretty high above ground. And this is 
was captured at 35 points per square meter leaf on. Now, if you look down on the ground here, you can see where there's no vegetation. It's really, really good on the ground. And you can see even under the vegetation, some went through in the green. So we did have some vegetation penetration for leaf on, 35 points per square meter. When we had red, we actually collected the same area at 5 points per square meter leaf off. And you can see down here that we've got an awful lot of reds in an area where there's hardly any green because there was no vegetation to obstruct in here. And what we've discovered over doing many of these is something like a 7x, so 5 to 35, uh, in this particular deciduous forest, which is this hardwood area, um, a 35 will get you similar data to five points leaf off. Now, does that really matter? Well, it can't. Um, you know, you, you may still be able to get, it, get away with 20, but in this particular experiment, a 7x ratio worked out in order to get us similar uh, post-process data. Thank you for the five minutes. I'll move a little quicker. I don't have that much to go. Uh, and on, this is a flat grassy area, and there's a point cloud here. And you can see five points per square meter green. Look how flat that is. Look at all those data points on the ground. And here's 35 points per square meter, and that's leaf on. And you can see there's still some green down here, but not much, not much. You're getting a lot of stuff above the flat area. So now, why might that be? Well, in flat areas, think about when that's taken. Okay, it's snowed, right? Grass is completely flattened down by the snow. There's no weeds. There's nothing else in there. Also, this happens to be geographically a very flat area. So when you're flying grassy areas, you have to take into consideration there's going to be a lot of weeds and other obstructions in there. Another example, this is a good one. Crops, 20 points per square meter leaf on. What do you guys think that is? What's that look like? That's corn. That's absolutely right. And you can see, you can get down there. It looks pretty good. Go through the corn. Blue, no corn, nice and flat here. So that's a two points. So in this particular analysis, we found a 10x. We'll get you through corn safely, no problem. Low crop on left here, two points per square meter, 20 points per square meter, no green. No green whatsoever made it through the low crop. Now, I'm going to ask a question, and Dr. Johnson, you are not allowed to answer this. We'll go back one. You have a contract set up three, three times. You've got to fly this thing, right? July, three years. Why is it a risk? It's a risk because crop rotation. Corn one year, soybeans next year, nothing third year. Got to think about that stuff. Quickly, red, green, five points per square meter. Deciduous trees on the left, pine trees on the right. Ground and understory can sometimes be more prominent beneath hardwoods. Got to think about that. Pine trees are nice and flat. Grassy field, nothing. Bumpy. This is what contours look like. Grassy field, leaf off. Leaf on, messy. Same here. Leaf on, leaf off. Vegetation rules of thumbs. I'll let you read these guys. I'm not going to go through those whole things. But this is key. What's your, what's your and your customers good enough? Drones. Again, flight height limited. We talked about some of this earlier. Restricted airspace in Class B. You can't fly there. Speed limited. Smaller field of view. Here's some stuff from requirements. FAA, points per square meter in accuracy, 500 points per square meter, areas and size limitations, here's your rules of thumb. Imagery and LIDAR collected at the same time are not typical in drones. And drones are another excellent tool in your toolbox, and I'm just about done. AI and ML possibilities, Dr. Johnson went very deeply into this stuff. I did some research. The FAA is, is working on, on um, AI and ML. Here's a some information 
on Lido's presentations, the drone flights. I'll let you guys look up those if you'd like. Europeans are ahead of us a little bit. They have this whole report. It's a really boring reading, but <laughs> however, it's very interesting as well. Right now, our AI and ML LIDAR uh, manned aerial um, is, is mainly focused on um, deconflicting airspace. They're not doing a lot beyond that with manned aerial, and it's highly focused on self-driving and terrestrial applications. Here's your conclusions. Many variables to consider. Some are unknown. Rules of thumb we talked about. Drones are an excellent for the toolbox. AI and ML can assist with some functions. Only way to know what it can be anticipated is to collect the data and to process it. Thank you. Sorry, I went a little over. <laughs>